Thank you. We're really pleased to, to have a member of the committee, Susan Mock, uh, give us a presentation today on anxiety and depression, which, as many of you know, um, constitutes a large proportion of the calls that we get now from attorneys, especially younger attorneys in their first five years of practice uh, when they're having difficulty um, being able to continue with their practice or know what to do. So thank you, Susan. You're welcome. So I'm going to start with a uh, little bit of a story. This is called The Story of David. This is from the Missouri Bar Journal. David was an attorney in his early 50s when he came to work for a major law firm in the Missouri metropolitan area. He had excellent academics and held positions in a number of prestigious law firms and legal departments. It was later learned that he left each of these positions due to personality clashes with his supervisors. David was eccentric in some ways. He would show up for work at 6.30 a.m. every morning with a triple shot of espresso. He went through the day with many helpings of Red Bull. He was energetic, talked quickly, had a wicked sense of humor and a sharp tongue. He was quick to judge others, which some found abrasive. Others found him charming, and he enjoyed the intellectual banter. He was well regarded by management for the number of hours that he worked. He could also be arrogant and resentful. He was known to have commented to a number of people that life was just too crazy or not worth living. Those comments were not taken seriously. During the later part of his tenure, he was separated from his wife and child. He appeared to have an inappropriate relationship with the secretary in the firm. He saw a counselor who advised him that he had a serious alcohol problem. He was consuming approximately one-fifth of liquor at a night, and although he was maintaining his work schedule, members of the firm knew that he drank excessively, but no one suggested that he seek help. Apparently, management felt that the action was entirely up to David. While he was on administrative leave and after an evening of drinking, he contacted the secretary with whom he had the relationship. She and her husband had complained to management. He then proceeded to tell a number of people he was disappearing for the weekend and intended to kill himself. Several members of the firm went to find David and tried to get him into treatment, or at least take him someplace where he was safe until he was no longer suicidal. However, he found a place near his hometown where he wouldn't be discovered, made a number of farewell calls, and killed himself. So, why is there a lawyer's assistance program. The ABA estimates that 15 to 20 percent of attorneys, judges, are with addiction or mental health issues. The lawyer's use of drugs and alcohol is twice that of other professions, and lawyers experience depression at twice the rate of non-lawyers and four times the rate of the general population. These are statistics from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, and most uh, recently, we add to that suicide rates for lawyers, which have now surpassed dentists. A guy named Will Meyerhoff, who's an attorney from New York, wrote a book called Way Worse Than Being a Dentist, which is about the impact of suicide on uh, attorneys. And while depression is still seen as a sign of weakness and still a stigma, that's slowly changing. And so now there are websites, there are support groups, and there are LAPs. So what is it about lawyers that give them some unique mental health issues? Everybody experiences stress. We know that stress can be positive or negative. Certain events in our lives uh, cause stress, but it can be good stress. Weddings, a birth. Uh, stress is less about what happens to us and more about how we cope. But law is a stressful profession. And in our manuals, there's a list of stressors that are specifically reported by lawyers. Deadlines and inadequate time to complete jobs, the stakes that, that are high from loss of property, freedom, or even life, clients' high expectations, constant scrutiny and critical judgment from opponents and from the court. The list goes on and on. This is in your manual on, at section three, page one. So the, the stressors that are facing lawyers are more pervasive, more intense, uh, and those stress levels are high among law students as well. 
whereas 43% of graduate students in general report that they've experienced stress and 70% of medical students, 96% of law students say that they have been under, under extreme stress. And this is from a Yale survey. Students describe a culture where stress is seen as a badge of honor, where competition is palpable, where students, faculty, and administration all place an inordinate amount of emphasis on winning the rat race. Even some of those students who did not feel that they had experienced mental health challenges at law school described highly disruptive or unhealthy or significant levels of stress and even depression. Several note that while they themselves had not experienced it, they would describe a mental, that mental health challenges they see in their peers colored their own and cast a cloud over the community. And a few people in the field of psychology have written more about what is it particularly about the law or lawyers that makes for this high level of stress. And a guy named Martin Seligman, who writes a lot about optimism and positive psychology, identified two things. Perfectionism was one, because the law is so detail-oriented and there's such high expectations that both clients and colleagues come at problem solving with an expectation that everything will be perfect. Lawyers are expected to solve everyone's problems, to be tough, to be strong. And a pessimism which is adaptive. It's sort of built into the system because most of what lawyers deal with are not happy events. And there's a third, and that is the perpetual nature of the conflict, that lawyers go from one conflict situation to another. And that's the nature of the beast and the nature of their days. So I'm going to talk a little bit about mood disorders. And a mood disorder is the sustained emotions that color the way that we live. 20% of women and 10% of men in this country have had mood disorders, clinically diagnosed mood disorders. Depression is the highest problem identified by the attorneys who contact the LAP. Six million American men will be diagnosed with depression this year, but many suffer silently. And again, lawyers have the highest of suicide rates. Uh, I think I skipped one. Okay. Let me go. What is depression? <laughs> depression is a mood disorder and probably uh, one of the more complicated mood disorders in that there's a long list of kinds of depression. And we're just going to talk about the most prevalent ones. Depression is not just feeling down. Uh, anhedonia, which is a loss of interest in things, a loss of enthusiasm, a loss of pleasure in things that you formerly enjoyed. Altered perceptions and a biological imbalance. We know now that there are different levels of uh, serotonin and norepinephrine that impact the brain and when those are off kilter, people feel depressed. But there's a long list, and I brought my DSM manual uh, just to show you the, the volume. Uh, there's a long list of symptoms of depression, which include feelings of sadness. And again, these are in, in your manual. Uh, feelings of sadness, emptiness, unhappiness, angry outbursts, irritability, frustration over little things, a loss of interest or pleasure in normal activities, Sleep disturbance, sleeping too much, sleeping too little. Tiredness, lack of energy, even small tasks take an extra effort. Changes in appetite, agitation, anxiety, which lead to excess worrying, pacing, and feelings of worthlessness. Let me go back. Depression is an illness. And when it's diagnosed clinically and a certain number of those symptoms reoccur over a certain period of time, someone is diagnosed with a clinical depression. It's a disturbance in neurotransmitters which control mood. Often comes with illness, someone who's just been diagnosed with uh, heart disease or cancer, 
often feels depressed. You did not cause it. There's a high genetic component with depression and bipolar disorder in particular. 80 to 90 percent of people who are diagnosed with bipolar disorder have a family history. And the heritability, I love that word, for depression is 40 percent. Self-blame is counterproductive but very prevalent. Most people blame themselves and there's still that sense of what, what, what did I do wrong? Uh, lawyers in particular will think, what, why am I less than somebody who doesn't have depression? And it can come at any age, although the average age for depression, the onset of depression is 32, at least in this country. It can also present with feeling numb, feeling flat, feeling without emotion, or at least with the inability to experience a full range of emotions. And there's still a lot of stigma and a lot of ignorance associated with depression. People who will still respond to it by saying you're just in a slump, or pick yourself up by the bootstraps, or don't complain, you have a lot to be thankful for. So we know that it's still a disease that many people suffer in silence. Other way. Types of depression, there's lots of them. But the most common ones are major depression, which we sometimes refer to as unipolar as opposed to bipolar depression, which is four of those symptoms that are listed, uh, four or more of those symptoms over a period of two weeks or longer, along with a depressed mood. Chronic depression, which is a less intense but more pervasive kind of depression that lasts for years and has to uh, present itself for at least two years. Manic depression, which is the ups and downs, uh, the swings of mood, but the manic periods are not necessarily euphoric. They're not necessarily happy periods. They're just intense periods. Uh, the mania can be accompanied by feelings of grandiosity, uh, an exaggerated sense of self-esteem, people who talk fast, who move fast, who drive fast, uh, have less need for sleep, their activity is sped up, their, and their judgment sometimes poor. Uh, and we talk about people who are rapid cyclers, there are people whose mood swings several times in the course of a day, people who are still with bipolar but they may have occasional manic episodes. Seasonal affective disorder, which is what we in Idaho suffer from when we've got lots of days of gray skies. Uh, it's brought on by the absence of sunlight. Postpartum depression, which comes with hormonal changes after a woman gives birth. And double depression, which is a phrase we don't hear much anymore, but it refers to depression with alcohol addiction or dependence. 30% of people with major depression and 60% of people with bipolar disorder also have alcohol or drug issues. And then there's more. There's disruptive mood dysregulation order premenstrual dysphoric disorder, substance medication-induced depression, depressive disorders due to another medical condition, and then the great category of other depressions. Um, most important thing, I think, for our purposes is just to recognize that we're looking at a couple of things when we're trying to help somebody determine are they depressed. All of those characteristics, all of those symptoms, but also the notion of how long have you felt this way, if this has been going on for a, a period of time. So here again are the symptoms. I won't go through them again, because um, again, they're in the manual. And the manic symptoms, increased energy, talking, sexual activity, spending, those are all behaviors that could be viewed as manic. And usually between manic episodes or between manic and depressed episodes, people feel a sense of despair. They feel a sense of hopelessness and, and sometimes also just physical exhaustion. A few facts about men and depression. Now let me read to you.
For nearly a decade while serving as an elected official and working as an attorney, Massachusetts State Senator Bob Antonini struggled with depression, though he didn't know it. Most days he attended Senate meetings and appeared on behalf of his clients, but privately he was irritable and short-tempered, ruminating endlessly over his cases and becoming easily frustrated by small things, like deciding which TV show to watch with his girlfriend. He'd be so exhausted by noon that he'd drive home and collapse on the couch, unable to move for the rest of the day. Goes on. In 2002, his chief of staff discovered him on the floor of his state house office, unable to stop crying. He then decided to open up to friends and family. A few months later, he was invited to speak at a mental health conference, and he found the courage to talk publicly about his problem. Soon after, a local reporter wrote about his ongoing struggle. Instead of being greeted with jeers, he was hailed as a hero. The response was universally positive. I was astounded. But the number of people who keep this quiet because they're really afraid of the response. So six million men in America will be diagnosed with depression in 2018. Millions more suffer silently, unable or unwilling to seek help. It's estimated that $83 billion is lost in productivity due to depression. Men kill themselves at the rate of four times that of women. While more women attempt suicide, more men are successful because, why? The means they use. Yeah, exactly. Lethal weapons. Primary care doctors, going to Mahmoud's observation about sending people to their primary care doctor, now have a little, many of them have a little uh, questionnaire that they ask as sort of part of the routine of going through a medical exam. In the past two weeks, have you been bothered by either little interest or pleasure in doing things? You used to play golf, now you, you're not, you've sort of given it up. Feeling down, depressed, or hopeless? And if the answers to those two questions are yes, there are seven more questions. Because it's easier for the doctor to show, particularly a male, a score as opposed to saying, talking about depression. If he has a number and he can point to that number, that's going to be more persuasive. The other point I'll just make uh, on the side is primary care doctors often know the individual and the family better than anybody else because they've seen that family over the years. So it's another good reason why it's a, a, a good referral source because uh, they can make comparisons. Last time I saw you six months ago or knowing something about what the family had gone through. <clears throat> Twice as many women report being depressed as men, which is both the bad news and the good news, because women do talk about mood disorders more. They'll come to somebody for help, um, but also the numbers seem so much higher. Male brains are larger, but women have 11% more brain cells. Women's brains are more developed in areas responsible for nonverbal communication. And men's brains are more developed in areas responsible for aggression. Women secrete more melatonin in the winter, less in the summer. The levels for men stay the same. So there are, again, biological, physiological reasons for uh, the difference in the sexes in that way. Uh, women's estrogen levels ebb and flow, and women respond to the impact of aging differently. It's much more of a, at least, verbalized concern. And I would add to this list, women continue to feel the effects of role overload and role conflict more than men, both in their personal and professional lives. Women's self-worth is more tied to relationships. We spend a lot more time gabbing with the girls. Um, and are more likely to admit to problems and seek help in those contexts. So th the other mood disorder that I'm going to address is anxiety. And anxiety, again, is what we have all experienced to some degree, but different from stress, because it's more of a sense of apprehension, uh, more like fear not just the frustration that comes with stress. It's the flight or fight response uh, that we all have as a natural response to an unnatural condition. There are genetic components to anxiety. There are certainly people who are born with a predisposition to anxiety, and often we see that even in children. 
The root of an anxiety disorder may not be the threat that it triggers, but the breakdown of the mechanism that keeps the response from careening out of control. Again, it's not so much what happens to us, but how we cope, how we deal with a car that stops suddenly in front of us. Uh, the Betty Ford survey that was done five years ago or so found 19% of all practicing attorneys had significant symptoms of anxiety and more prevalent in the younger attorneys, those who were in the first 10 years of practice. Anxiety differs from stress. As I said, stress brings more frustration and nervousness, whereas anxiety brings fear, worry, dis unease, really also a sense of helplessness, that there's nothing that we can do. And the types of anxiety, which are kind of on a spectrum, uh, again, have many of the same symptoms, and again, I'll reference you to the manual, which, which has a good list, but there are things like uh, dizziness, vertigo, heart palpitations, sweating, sweaty palms, chest pain, hot and cold flashes, faintness, numbness, and again, it requires at least four of these over a period of time. Uh, and those are the characteristics of a panic disorder. Obsessive compulsive disorders are unwanted thoughts or rituals that are recurrent and persistent. And the thoughts might be something like uh, magical thinking. I had a client who had to count the number of pieces of anything that was on her plate and it had to be an odd number. She had to have a certain number of string beans or a certain number of french fries, and she could only have an odd number. And she wouldn't begin to eat until she had counted all of those. So the obsession is that there's something wrong with even numbered french fries. <laughs> and the compulsion is the behavior. So the compulsion of going back to check the coffee pot to see that it's unplugged in the morning, even though I've already been inside and out of the house three times already. And I know it's unplugged. Okay. So that's obsessive compulsive disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder we associate most with war veterans or people who are victims of assault. It's a complicated disorder. Um, again, not something we, we need to diagnose as much as just being aware that people who've had histories of trauma certainly can be more susceptible to PTSD. Social phobia, which is avoiding social situations, fear of embarrassment or humiliation. And again, not just on occasion, which we all experience, but this is a persistent, irrational fear, which interferes with people's lifestyles because they can't go into a crowd or they will avoid going to a meeting um, out of uh, a phobic response. And generalized anxiety disorder, which is the most prevalent disorder, anxiety disorder, GAD, chronic or exaggerated worry that is unfounded or more severe than normal. Again, with motor tension, shakiness, jumpiness, vigilance, apprehensive expectation. Quick list of symptoms. Panic disorder, phobia, and other kinds of phobia as well, fear of heights, fear of crowds, fear of snakes. There's a long list of phobic responses. Obsessive compulsive disorder, preoccupation with specific images and impulses, PTSD and generalized anxiety disorder, which affects nine, seven million people in this country. How do these uh, mood disorders spill over into the workplace? We see patterns of decreased productivity, irritability, safety issues, people who are uh, coming to work with anxiety or depression, absenteeism, of course, increased alcohol and drug use, complaints of fatigue and ailments, and conflict with other employees. What are the treatment options for depression and anxiety? Again, some of the things that we've just talked about. Medication, which over the past, since the 70s, has become sort of a, a, an automatic uh, rule of thumb. Lots of people who are on medication, lots of people who are um, 
on medication for extensive periods of time, some of them for the rest of their lives, because again, it's correcting a chemical imbalance that they couldn't do otherwise. Diet, important, and this for a profession that skips meals or eats at their desk, so especially important. Uh, exercise, we really strongly encourage people, particularly with mood disorders, to engage in exercise on a regular basis, whether it's walking or yoga or swimming, something. And sleep, which again, for the legal profession that pulls all-nighters or bills 300 hours a month is sometimes difficult to, to do. And the recommended uh, daily allowance for sleep has increased in this country to where we're recommending that people get seven or eight hours of sleep. Just having four or five doesn't really cut it. Light therapy for seasonal affective disorder, you can replace light bulbs with something called full spectrum lights that simulate sunlight. You can buy boxes that you sit on your desk that simulate sunlight, and for a lot of people that's the ticket, that's the cure. Uh, psychoeducation, giving people articles and books to read, therapy, which is what I do. Um, and lately, uh, meditation and mindfulness, which has become part of a few law schools' curriculum, Cal Berkeley and University of San Francisco, uh, and Yale actually have uh, meditation classes that they offer. Uh, and you don't have to go up to the mountaintop or wear funny clothes. You can learn to meditate uh, just the way you are and asking for help. I'll talk just quickly about the risks of suicide. There's a 15% fatality rate for people who attempt suicide, although that word attempt is a, a broadly defined. Uh, in this country, 4% of the population have contemplated suicide and 3% with continuing thoughts over a period of two weeks. And these numbers are on the rise. And we see higher rates of suicide or suicidality, the, the uh, think, thinking about suicide, among younger people uh, in the last 10 years. People with anxiety at more at risk. Alcohol and drug abuse increases risk. 75 to 80 percent of people who are contemplating suicide or who attempt suicide give some verbal indication. And the statistics suggest that most people who do give a verbal indication really don't want to die, uh, but they feel such a level of despair. That's their call for help is the suicide attempt. Isolation is a key issue, so we look again to see if it's somebody who lost a spouse or who's getting older and is more isolated just by virtue of aging. Family history, definitely a predisposition in families. Uh, social conflict, physical illness, and people in the mental health profession believe that 5% of the suicidal population are what we would call hardcore. They don't give warnings, they don't ask for help, they don't give any indication, and they use a weapon that kills them quickly because they are bound and determined to take their own lives. Warning signs to watch for, talking about wanting to die is one. Talking about feeling hopeless or lacking a reason to live. Talking about feeling trapped or in unbearable pain or talking about being a burden to others. Increasing use of alcohol and drugs. Acting anxious, agitated, or reckless. Sleeping too much or too little. Withdrawing or isolating themselves showing rage or talking about seeking revenge, and extreme mood swings. And let me bring this back to our role, how to help. Be direct, talk openly about suicide. Used to be that we didn't think that was a good idea, that we sort of tiptoed around the notion of talking with somebody about suicide. That's really not true anymore. We recognize that we ask people, have you thought about self-harm? Do you have a plan? We ask those direct questions. Listen empathetically. You want to let people know that you care, that you're there to be of help. Be non-judgmental. Don't debate. You're not going to try to talk somebody out of anything. 
Don't lecture, don't be shocked, don't be sworn to secrecy. Talk about alternatives, but without glib reassurance that something will definitely help. And then I included the get help by calling the suicide prevention lifeline and the phone numbers. I included in your packet, I think, a copy of uh, Burns Anxiety Inventory and a Beck Depression Inventory. Those are two old, old, very tried and true tests for both depression and anxiety. And then a little article uh, by Lynn Johnson on the ways of listening and how to be a good, deep, caring listener. And that's all. Okay. Questions? Any questions? Oh, thank no. you. Okay.